You've heard of the double pendulum before? That's boring. Today, I want to look at the 3D double pendulum. Not only are we going to solve it by setting up our differential equations using SymPy, solve them numerically using SciPy, but we're going to animate them in 3D using a beautiful animation library in Python I just found. And no, it's not matplotlib. We're not making a boring animation like you're used to. We're going to make a lovely, beautiful 3D animation, which you're just about to see right now. Oh, and subscribe. Welcome to the 3D Zone. Simulations a go. This plot from Matplotlib? Now that's gonna be a no. Shadows are on the ground. Pendulum Bob is round. Hey Disney, hire me. My animating so sound. Yeah. That's right. Got our own physics engine, bro. That's so tight. 3D double pendulum. Hey. Do your thing, lines of motion so cray, I say that's a banger. It's a banger. I say that's a banger. I say that's a banger. So introducing the packages today, we have NumPy, always have NumPy, uh, SymPy for doing all the algebra that I really don't want to do by hand, uh, SciPy for actually solving the numerical equations that we get, then we have matplotlib for plotting and some animation as well. Just kidding, we're not using matplotlib for animation, Bye bye we're going to use something far better to make a beautiful 3D simulation, and I'll get to that later in the video once we actually solve the uh, 3D double pendulum. So here's a diagram I came up with. Uh, you note the coordinate system here, X, Y, and Z. So you have your double pendulum, sort of like in 2D. You have theta as like sort of the angle that this pendulum is going out at. Uh, theta 2 is the angle that this is going out at. But of course you also have for 3D, phi 1 and phi 2, because the pendulum can sort of rotate around like this. And so phi is sort of the uh, azimuthal angle in the xy plane. Again, a word I don't know if I've ever said properly. And you can just quantify it like that. And so as the double pendulum is going, it's no longer confined to a single plane. It can rotate around and it'll still do like fancy stuff in theta, but it also has an angular momentum component in sort of around the z axis. This is something that just isn't there in the regular uh, 2D double pendulum. So this isn't really much more complicated than the 2D double pendulum when you're working in Python. You just have to deal with these extra variables. And so I highly suggest, if you haven't seen it, check out my basic 2D double pendulum video. Go through that, it's very simple, and this is just a little basic extension to that video. So we'll do things very similar to that video. We're gonna define all our symbols using SymPy. We'll just take it nice and slow, and we'll think what are all the symbols that we need. Well, we need time, obviously, so we'll define T, that's a symbol. G for gravity, that's gonna be a symbol. We have the two masses of the pendulums. Those are also symbols. And L1 and L2, these are also symbols. So what does that mean? Well, if I run these cells and I find it like this, SymPy allows you to define symbols that you can do mathematical operations on. And of course, I can do things like take derivatives and it will, you know, take derivative of T squared or something. So, and I usually specify with respect to what variable. And so I have all these variables now that I can sort of build up equations with. Now we wanna solve Lagrange's equations. So we're gonna to need to do a little bit more complicated stuff. So at the end, what we really want is four functions as a function of time. We want theta one as a function of time, phi one, theta two, and phi two as functions of time. If we know what those are as functions of time, we can find the locations of these sort of uh, bobs and that gives the entire description of what's happening with the double pendulum. So everything in this video is gonna be based on finding these as functions of time. So what we can do when we start is we're gonna define theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two. We're gonna actually define them as unknown functions of time to start, which we'll eventually solve for. This is sort of the convention when you're solving differential equations uh, using SymPy or at least setting them up. 
And so what I do is like before when I define these symbols, uh, rather than doing it, you know, like how I did it above, I define these four variables, theta one, theta two, phi one and phi two. And I use sort of the LaTeX convention here, but I use CLS is equal to simpy.function. So this is a little different than above. So theta one, of course, is unspecified right now. It's actually not showing its LaTeX form. It won't do that until you actually specify what it's a function of. Simpy doesn't know what it actually is a function of right now. But then below we can say, all right, these are explicitly functions of time. Like, you know, there's a variable time that you'll give it and it will return a number. And so this is what I do here. I say theta one is theta one of time. Theta two is theta two of time. Same with phi, obviously. And now if I look at these, you can see that it's actually specified like theta one of time. And if I, you know, take the derivative of this with respect to time, uh, it doesn't know what the derivative is, of course, but it will return something like this. So this allows me to, you know, manipulate functions and derivatives. And I can manipulate them, get some big equation that involves functions and derivatives, and that essentially is a differential equation. So this notation I'm using here allows me to manipulate things that have functions, their derivative, big complicated equations, to then manipulate them around and get an easy, in this case, second order differential equation. So below I actually define the derivatives. I want my own variables for the derivatives and the second derivatives. So underscore D means first derivative, underscore DD means second derivative. It's just an easy convention. Remember that for this video. So D is a single derivative, DD is a double derivative. I'll mention that later, but it's good to get that in your head. That's the convention I'm using. So for that, I just take the derivative of theta one with time. I specify that in a variable theta one D. And for theta one, the second derivative, well, I take the derivative of the first derivative with respect to time. And I do this for theta one, theta two, phi one and phi two. So after running the cell, you know, I can see phi one DD, the second derivative of phi one, if I can type here. And you can see D squared DT squared of phi one of T. So I have all the derivatives and all the second derivatives defined. And you know that Lagrangian mechanics you know, it involves all these derivatives and second derivatives. So I'm just defining a lot of variables so that when I set up my Lagrange's equations, I can just feed them in directly. So I'm also going to define x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2 as functions of theta1, theta2, phi1, and phi2. And the reason for this is because when specifying the kinetic and the potential energy of Lagrange's equations, it's easier to specify it as one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared for both bobs, right? So I don't have to worry about what's going on with the angles or anything like that. So I can define x1. Well, let, let's look at the diagram above here, right? So x, right, is going to be cosine of phi one times sine of theta one, you know, times L one. So L one sine of theta one will give you this length here, multiply by cos of phi one and that gives you sort of the X component of what's happening here. It's just like dealing with regular spherical coordinates, essentially. So these are exactly what the components would be in spherical coordinates with, you know, L1 here. So the first Bob is pretty easy. L1 sine theta one cos phi one. Y1 is L1 sine theta one sine phi one. You'll see the similarity with spherical coordinates here. Z1 is minus L1 cos theta one because Z is pointing downwards. So that, that's sort of the convention that's used here. For the location of the second bob, that's just the location of the first bob, plus, you know, this other thing here. So it means that x2 is x1 plus, um, and I, this should be actually written L2. Good catch, me, before I solve this video. And so x1 plus L2 sine theta 2 cos theta 2. So it's just taking the x of the first bob and then adding the set x of the second bob. That's just adding vectors together. You can think of this as like r1, the location of the first bob, plus, you know, the component of where the pendulum is actually bending down each of the components there. So now I have all these components and I can look at them. And so now I'm starting to build up things a little bit more complicated. And you'll see why this comes in handy for defining kinetic energy, because I can differentiate this with respect to T, which I need because the kinetic energy is proportional to the derivative of X1 with respect to time. And I get something that looks like this. And now doing this by hand, a little bit of a pain, especially when there's six things here and they all chain when I get that uh, kinetic energy. It's, it's not fun to do and they're squared as well. So good luck squaring this and dealing with that, especially in Lagrange's equations. So here I'm going to create numerical functions. So what does that mean? 
I have my SymPy expression for x1, right? I can show that here. And I want a function, I want a Python function where you give me theta1, theta2, and l1, and phi1, and I want you to tell me what's the location in x. I want just numbers in and numbers out. That's a numerical function. It's different than this symbolic expression. And so what I do is I use simp.lambdafy. So it takes in all the arguments, and you'll note that all the arguments here are like theta1, theta2, phi1, phi2, l1, and l2. If I know all those variables, I can get the location of the two bobs. And so in all these simp.lambdafys, I just specify sometimes there's excess parameters. Like x1 doesn't depend on l2 and phi2, but I just feed them in here anyways. And it just means that like I don't actually need them. It will only use theta1, um, phi1, and l1, right? It, it just won't care about the other parameters. And it returns x1. So underscore f always means numerical function in my video. You feed me in, in this case, six numbers. For x1, only three of them matter. The other ones could be anything. And so, for example, three numbers here, and it will tell you the location of x1. Same with y1, z1, x2, y2, z2. So these are numerical functions. And you'll see what I mean. If I go x1, f, and say I feed it in, you know, theta1 is pi over 4. That's the first argument that comes in here. Theta2 could be anything, so I'm just going to give it 0. Uh, phi1, I'll give it maybe pi over 4 as well. Uh, phi2, again, it could be anything. It doesn't depend on phi2, so I'll just put 0. And L1, I'll say, is 2. And L2, again, could be anything, so I'll put 0 here. And you'll see it will return the value of x1. In this case, it's equal to 1. If I put in a length of 1, 0 0.5. If I put in a length of 5, it's like this. And I can specify other parameters here. This is going to be used later on. Once I get my theta1 as a function of time, this will help me get x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2 as functions of time. And when I have arrays as function of time, I can use those to create the animation because I'll actually have the coordinates of the two bobs. So I can use the derivative of x1, y1, and z1, x2, y2, z2 that I specified you know, here. I can just take derivatives of them to get the kinetic and the potential energy. So what's the kinetic energy of the system? Well, it's really easy. It's 1 half m1 v squared. So 1 half m1, x1 dot squared, y1 dot squared, z1 dot squared, right? And that's just 1 half m v squared. That's why I specified x1, y1, and z1, because it's easy to specify kinetic energy that way. I don't know off the top of my head how to specify the kinetic energy in terms of theta1, phi1, theta2, phi2, angular momentum. It gets complicated. No way I'm doing that. I'm just going to specify x and y and z for both bobs like this and then do this. And again, if you were to do this by hand, gross, like there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of terms. Like I said, if you take the derivative of this with respect to time and square it, this is just looking at one of these expressions. Big long thing here, right? Like you don't want to take the square of this, it's gross. And same thing with theta two, and I have three of them for each. So this is why SymPy is really handy. Uh, the total kinetic energy is just the sum of these two for the two bobs. Uh, this is the potential energy of the first bob, potential energy of the second bob, right? Remember, Z1 is negative. I specified it like that here, where it's minus L1 cos theta 1. So, you know, M1 G Z, well, Z is negative, so that's fine there. A total potential energy is the sum of the two of them. And then the Lagrangian is just T minus V. So I run this cell, and I look at my Lagrangian, and I told you it would be complicated. And I look at L, and it's this big, long expression here, right? And remember, we're not done. Once you have the Lagrangian, you have to take the derivative with respect to theta 1 and the derivative with respect to theta 1 dot. So good luck taking the derivative with theta 1 and theta 1 dot and then solving them, right? But with Python, with SymPy, very easy to do. Like I said, simp.diff, you can take the derivative of L with respect to theta 1, right? Is that how I specify? I think I gave theta 1. Yeah, theta 1 like that. And it will actually take the derivative. And it's a big, long thing, right? It's another big mess. So it does it instantaneously. By hand, it might take you like three hours. You make a mistake, another three hours. You know, infinite amount of time, human, to do this. You know, especially for me. I'm not great at this. So here's taking the derivative of theta 1. And I need to do this for all four things. I need dl d theta 1 minus d dt of dl d theta 1 dot. That's just Lagrangian mechanics. This is... Lagrangian mechanics says... You have all the derivatives, and I'll tell you how to get your differential equations. But then you still have to solve them. So this is just the step where we're getting our differential equations that we'll eventually solve. 
So I have to do this for all four parameters. That's one derivative, two derivatives, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I showed you one of eight that would take nine hours. You take eight, 27 hours, maybe a month to do, right? For me, at least a month. If I had to do this by hand, I don't know what I would do. It would be a very sad day. So this is how to do it. You get eight derivatives and it does it instantaneously on the computer. It's beautiful. So this is my first Lagrange's equation, second, third, fourth. So I just take dl d theta one minus d dt. That's the outside derivative here. This outside derivative with respect to t and then the inner derivative here. So this is like dl d theta one dot and then uh, overall derivative with respect to time for that. And I simplify them because it gets a little bit complicated for simplify to do. If I call dot simplify on an expression, it just makes it, it reduces it a little bit in simpy. So I can get my four derivatives, right? Okay, it takes simpy a little bit. So, you know, I'm asking it to do eight, pretty long derivatives. But again, it won't take any more than 20 seconds to find all these Lagrangian uh, equations here. So it took about 30 seconds. I have my four Lagrange's equations, just the things on the left hand side here. They do equal zero, but I'm just computing the expressions that are the things on the left hand side. And again, I can look at them and they're pretty long, right? This is my first Lagrange's equation. And this is a differential equation that's equal to zero. And it's coupled with three other differential equations. So good luck solving that by hand. It's impossible, basically. But there's a beautiful thing in Lagrangian mechanics, which says, you know, you might have the first derivative squared. You might have these factors here. Um, you know, here's things where the, you know, first derivative of phi two and first derivative of theta two, they product together. But these equations are always linear in the second derivative. If I see d squared dt squared of theta one, that will only show up as a factor on its own. They'll never be that factor squared. So essentially what that means is because the second derivatives and there's four second derivatives, theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two, and four equations. Yes, they're very nonlinear equations in a lot, all the parameters, but in terms of second derivatives, four equations, four unknowns, linear equations in the second derivatives. So what that means is I can solve all four of these equations and get second derivative of theta one is equal to something. Second derivative of theta two is equal to something. Second derivative of phi one is equal to something. And so it's all solved in terms of just first and you know the, the functions and then the first derivatives, right? That's a beautiful result of Lagrangian mechanics is that it's always linear in second derivatives. So if I have four equations here, I can solve this system of equations and get the second derivatives on one side and the complicated equations on the other side. So that's what I do here. I'm solving a system of linear equations and second derivatives, right? So I'm gonna get something that looks like this, and this is gonna be complicated, right? There, there's no way I'm gonna write this out, but it's gonna be a long expression. And so what I do is I take my four equations here, and when I call simp.solve, it assumes that all four of these equations, these expressions, rather, these are expressions, not equations. This is just all mathematical expressions, but I'm solving expression equals zero, which is an equation. So it says, if I put these in here, it's assuming they're all equal to zero. That's what how simp.solve works. And I'm solving for the second order derivatives. And because they're linear equations, simpy can do this relatively quickly. And so I'm gonna call this and I'm gonna get my four solutions here, just like this. And so it does it pretty fast, as you can see. So I have, this is important, I have four second order ODEs. But the problem, right, we run into an issue, is that Python can only solve systems of first order ODEs, not second order, so that we have an issue. But it's actually really easily resolvable because any system of second order differential equations can be written as a system of first order. And if you watch my earlier double pendulum video, you know what I'm talking about. So it requires defining new quantities, right? And so it's a clever trick, essentially. I'm gonna turn four second order ODEs, ODEDEs into eight first order ODEs. You can do that by defining new variables. So I'm gonna define O1 is d theta one dt and O2 is d theta two dt. I'm just defining new things here, right? I'm gonna do the same thing for phi. I'm defining like new variables that represent the first derivative. So every first derivative I have in my problem, which is d theta one dt, d theta two dt, d phi one dt, d phi two dt, they get new names. They're new variables, o one, w one, o two, w two. 
And by the way, these are like angular momentums. Well, then do1 dt is the second derivative of theta one. do2 dt is this, right? So th this is just a result. If I take the derivative of o1, well, that's just the second derivative like that. And as a result, and it takes a little bit of mental gymnastics to see this trick, but I now have eight first order ODEs because I have do1 dt, which is d squared theta one dt squared, given by my solution above. And then d theta one dt, well, that's just by definition equal to O1. So that's sort of like this. And it's the same thing for all the four other parameters. So my four equations that I solved above are the dot, dot, dots in these solutions. And then these other things are just equal to O1, O2, W1, W2 by definition. So by introducing new variables, I turned four second order ODEs into eight first order ODEs. That's very important. That's like a really important fact of solving complicated systems, especially when you need to solve them on a computer because computers don't do second order ODEs. They only do first order and you can make a lot more first order. It might seem more complicated for a human to solve, but for computers like, oh, it's that, that's fine. Like I can do first order ODEs. So now we need to solve these differential equations and we need numerical functions. We're done with the symbolic part. We have the differential equations that we need, but we want them numerical so we can actually solve them on a computer. So for that, I'm using the underscore F notation before. This is a function where I feed it in T, G, M1, M2, L1, L2. Yes, they don't depend on all these parameters, but again, like above, if they don't depend on those parameters, they just ignore them. Uh, D O one DT, remember, which is D squared theta one DT squared, D O one DT. It will depend on theta one, theta two, theta one dot first order, first derivative in theta one with respect to T theta two, and then phi one, phi two, phi one dot, phi two dot. And it takes in the solutions. By the way, this is how I get the solution for D theta one DT. I specify my solutions, which I solved above here. And it's, I'm saying, give me the solution corresponding to the second derivative of theta one with respect to time. And hopefully this doesn't crash my computer, but this is a really long expression, right? Like, I don't even know what's going on here, but it's, yeah, so big, 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 long expression. Again, like getting this by hand is basically impossible. Maybe there's tricks. I'm sure there's tricks where you can do it. If you're one of those really smart guys that, you know, does some clever variable stuff or does this using Hamiltonian mechanics or something, but you know, it, it's manageable by a computer. Uh, so I do the same thing for DO2, which is the theta two expression. And I say, okay, these are all the arguments that into the function. And I want the solution for theta two dot dot. That's the actual, you know, expression. That's where I feed in these variables to this function, symbolic function, creating a numerical function. Same thing with d theta one DT. Well, d theta one DT, right? which is uh, just O1, right? So it takes in something and it returns that. It's an identity function. It takes in O1 and it returns O1. It's the identity. Same thing with the theta 2 dt as a function, right? They just take in one thing, which is O1 or O2, and they return that very thing itself. Uh, and all the same things with phi, basically the same. So now that we have numerical functions for all eight of the first order ODEs that we need to solve. There's eight things here, eight functions, right? We set up our problem in a very simple way. I always do it like this in my videos. I define a vector S, which is all the variables I wanna solve for. Theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two, O one, O two, and W one, W two. So that's my vector. And at the end, I'm gonna have that vector for all times. It's gonna be an eight by N array where there's N times. And if we're gonna use an ODE solver in Python, it, it always is set up this way. We write in a function that takes in s and possibly time. In this case, it, our system doesn't depend on time, right? It's, well, it does depend on time, but the kinetic and potential energy don't have an additional time factor. Like there's no wind blowing that gets stronger with time or anything. So we don't really need to worry about this, but it's still a good practice to put it in there. So it takes an s and it returns ds dt. So the vector, right? It says that ds dt is a vector if I tell you what S is, in other words, if I tell you what theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two, O one, O two, W one, W two is, if I tell you what all these things are, I should be able to compute ds dt. So ds dt is a function of S. That's important. ds dt, the derivative of all these things 
is, is a function of those things. That's what a differential equation is. The derivative of something is a function of that thing, right? And that's what's going on here. The derivative, it's just in vector format when I have multiple ones. The derivative of all these things is proportional to all these things. So we can write it as like ds dt, which is a function of s and t. That's exactly how I write it in this function below. So it's a function ds dt, takes an s, which is a vector of eight things, time, which we don't really need, and then, of course, gravity and maybe the mass of the two pendulums and the length of the two pendulums, those are just extra parameters. So the first thing I do is I extract all the parameters from S. S is a vector of eight things. So I extract those eight things from S like that. And I just return all the derivatives. So let's look at the order of how I specified it. So I have theta 1, theta 2, phi 1, phi 2. So the first four things are the derivative of theta 1, theta 2, phi 1, phi 2. And then O1, O2, W1, and W2. And it's the first order derivative of all these things that are those big long expressions that I specified above. And that's sort of like these long lambda phi expressions here. So I feed in all the parameters that it needs. Remember that these are like the second order derivatives. So really it's saying that it depends on theta 1, theta 2, the derivative of theta 1, the derivative of theta 2, phi 1, phi 2, the derivative of phi 1, derivative of phi 2 but it's written in such a way that it's just a system of first order differential equations. So with the SDT, you then feed it in to a solver, ODE int, which is a SciPy function. And it says, if I know what DSDT is, and I know the initial conditions of all these things, and you tell me the times to solve over, and these are the parameters I'm using in this problem, I can give you your solution, right? And it does it pretty fast, even though the expressions are really long. So I call it like this and there's something missing. So now I've ran the cell above and I can specify this function and I give all the parameters and you'll see how long it takes for it to solve the solution of this problem. And it's very quick, as a matter of fact. I'll keep talking until it's done. And so I think it takes about 30 seconds and it should be coming up close now. Again, if you were to solve this by hand, it would take probably about a thousand years if you're lucky. I don't know, how, like, honestly, thinking about it, if I was asked to solve this problem by hand and I had to do finite differences for eight equations coupled and you gave me like a thousand workers to do this, like it would be, it would be a tough life. It would be a full life's project. It would be like building the pyramids just to solve this equation, which isn't very important. Like it's a cool equation, but it's not like the pyramids, right? But it would take the work of that. It would take like, an army of workers to solve something like this. Or you could just use a computer and do it very quickly. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, but again, much shorter than, you know, a thousand years. So that was about 30 seconds after I stopped talking and it solved it. So it took about a minute, which is pretty quick. And I have my answer. And so I have all eight of my variables, theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two, and all the derivatives as a function of time. So I can look at my answer kind of like this, right? And so I have eight different, well, my answer dot shape, I should have eight by, you know, 1001 times by eight. And I can extract different things from this. So here I get theta one and theta two is like my uh, first two components, kind of like this. And I can plot them as functions of time. So for example, I could go plot dot plot t theta one, make sure to show it. And yeah, I get something that looks like this, which is cool, but it's not, it doesn't really show off what's happening, right? Like, you know, here's phi one, which I don't have because I haven't specified it. Uh, but I could do theta two, for example, looks kind of like this, like pretty interesting. Let's actually look at phi one. So if I go phi one, I think that's this component here. I can plot phi one as a function of time. And it's kind of going like this. So yeah, th this isn't very interesting because it's going around and around and around and around. So it decreases. Um, but anyways, like you can see that there's interesting stuff going on with these parameters. So here's a function. I call it get pause. It takes in my arrays, theta one, theta two, phi one, phi two, L one and L two. And it returns X, Y, and Z as a function of all these parameters. So this will allow me to get arrays of X, Y, and Z for the first Bob, X, Y, and Z for the second Bob is a function of time, right? And so I call this function with, you know, it takes in theta one, theta two, uh, phi one, phi two. These are like numerical arrays that specify them as a function of time. Uh, the two lengths that I specify, and it actually saves them as a, uh, in a NumPy um, data format. And so this is where stuff gets fun. 
because I have these, right? And I can, again, plot these as a function of time, making sure to show the plot. I don't know, Matplotlib started doing this lately. So here's like x1 is a function of time. Uh, I could plot like z1 as a function of time kind of thing. But again, doesn't really show the interesting stuff. And I could even make an animation in Matplotlib, but no, I'm not doing that anymore, probably. Well, maybe. Um, there's a really simple program, and so let's get to that. Okay, so I haven't actually, in any video I've done before, done anything in a Python file. I'm always working in a notebook file. So here is just a Python text file. And it's a little bit harder to explain these things in not in a notebook format, but I think it's short enough that it shouldn't be too much of an issue of what's going on here. So what I'm using is something called vPython. You could just install it. Uh, their website is really informative. I'll put a link in the description of this video uh, to their website. They have lots of different ways to simulate things that are going on. But as you'll see in this video, it's very easy to use. Like it, this is all the code I need to make a beautiful 3D animation. The first thing I do is I load my data that I saved in from the notebook file that I've been working on. So I have my X, Y, Z of the two bobs. And if I know this, I can plot these in some 3D configuration to make an animation. So the first thing I do is I create two spheres that I'm going to use in this simulation. I call them ball one and ball two. These are like the balls of the double pendulum. So I just call vpython.sphere. I make one of them green, the other one blue. Their radius is 0 0.3 in this space that I'm working in. And I use something called make trail. So you can see these lines sort of following behind the bobs as they go. So it adds to the effect a little bit. And I retain 20 points. Uh, same thing with ball two. So I'm just creating two balls. Now the rods are what connects the two balls, right? And so I create cylinders. Their position is at zero, zero, zero. Uh, this is just, you know, creating them off the bat. I'll move them around eventually. I haven't put their position anywhere interesting yet. Um, but I, the most interesting thing is that their radius is 0 0.05. And of course the first rod, like, it's going to be sort of locked to one position and moving around with the first bob, but we're not getting to that yet. We're just specifying their shape. So ignore this. This is just their initial starting position, but it'll change. And then the radius is 0 0.05. So if the ball is like this, it just means that it's a very narrow rod that it's connecting the two balls. Uh, I used to have this base thing. I'm not using this anymore. Um, I have a different base. So it's a box, which is like, you know, uh, just a box. You know what a box is, but it's a, like sort of a, a floor. Right, so it's, it's got a very thin height and a very sort of wide width. And so its position is at the bottom, right? This position doesn't change, right? It's like the floor of a house. It doesn't move around. So it's at zero. By the way, it's the Y position in the simulation that switches with Z. It's a little bit confusing, right? Y is the vertical direction in this simulation software. So anything, I switch Y and Z. The Z in my simulation is like the height because that's what I'm used to. But for some reason, it's the Y that's like the height in this 3D simulation. So that's fine. Uh, it's axis. Well, this is just like the direction, I think, of the top of the box, maybe. I don't remember. And then I specify the size. So it's really long in X and Z, right, which is like the, the plane here at the floor. And then it's really small in height. It's only 0 0.5. And then I specify two shadows. The 3D software doesn't actually do shadows, so I create my own shadows using cylinders. I know it's a very high-tech ray tracing. They're essentially right below each sphere, so it creates that effect of you can see them on the ground, the projection. And so these, the, I'm just starting their position. It's at zero. It's like just above the floor, so you can see the shadow like popping above the floor. It's essentially like a tiny little divot above the floor, so you can see a shadow. It's very, very... Mickey Mouse way of making a shadow. Um, it, this specifies their axis. So the cylinder, like the height of the cylinder is pointing in the Y direction down. And I give them a 0 0.8 radius. So they're a little bit bigger than the actual uh, spheres themselves. And then I make them the color gray. So they show up as gray on the ground. So these are all the objects that I need. I've specified their initial state. So the way this simulation works, well, I print start in the terminal. And I have this variable I, which will sort of go through the 3D arrays. And I use a while loop, so it continues on forever until I stop the program. So I go, I think this is 30 frames per second, I'm not sure, or 30 updates per second. Um, 
I iterate through i, so this sort of goes through the array. And if i is beyond the length of the array, then it just goes back to the beginning. So that's so that, you know, I only have finitely many times that I've solved this for. So it goes to the end and then it goes to the beginning and then it sort of repeats. So if it goes, if the length is 1001, as soon as it goes to 1002, it goes back to zero. Then I specify the positions of everything. So this is where I use my data that I loaded in. So my first sphere position, it's the vector x1, z1, y1. Remember that z1 is the height here. It's confusing. So, uh, or y is the height in this 3D simulation software. So I specify z as the height. That's why I'm doing it in this sort of backwards order. So I specify the positions of my two balls. Um, then rod one. So that's the rod that connects to the first sphere that's you know moving around in the pendulum. Well, its axis goes along the direction of that sphere, right? So remember that it starts at zero, 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 rod one. That means that if I think of my sphere like this, one side of that sphere is connected at zero, 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 which is the origin. And then by changing the axis, it moves along with the ball. So the axis goes along the direction where this ball is pointed. So it connects. Um, rod two is a little more complicated because rod two is connected to the first ball. So its position or it's like one side of that cylinder is connected to the ball, right? So its position is equal to the position of the first ball. So I'm changing the position of the second rod, which is attached. It's like the double pendulum. The, the rod is attached to the ball itself. And so I change its position and then its axis. Well, its axis is X2 minus X1. So it's, it's the difference between the vectors because it needs to point in the direction of from the first ball to the second ball. And this is the, the vector that specifies pointing towards from the first ball to the second ball. So it's very simple. And then the shadow on the ground, well, that's just X. And then it's the height of the shadow, which is just barely above the floor. And then the Y, which is the you know other location on the floor. So it goes through this over and over and we'll open a terminal and we'll run this Python script. So I'm in the folder where the script is. It's called vtest.py. So I go Python vtest.py and it should open up a new window and you see that I have my simulation here and it looks pretty good right so I have my two um, spheres on my double pendulum and they're moving around and you have these beautiful trace where you can see the motion of it you can see the shadows are on the ground which is kind of nice because you know the program doesn't do that and I if I hold shift I can sort of drag around like this I can move around the camera like this. You can see it doesn't do shadows, right? So the light here, it's not creating a shadow on the two pendulums. And if I'm at this angle, it doesn't look great with the shadows on the ground, but at like any other angle, it kind of looks like, you know, there's a light from above that's shining down. You have the two um, pendulum bobs kind of on the uh, illuminated at least. Now it'd be a, kind of a cool update to, um, I'm getting distracted by the blue one. It was getting a lot of energy there. The two will sort of transfer energy with each other. But it'd be a cool sort of project if someone wants to do this to, you know, change the size of the shadows as the pendulum gets closer to the um, ground here. Like, of course, the ground is like this. Because, of course, as the pendulum gets closer to the ground, the shadows should shrink. And as they get farther away, they should get larger. And as they get larger, they should also get dimmer. So that, that was something I was thinking about doing, but I was like, this is going to take too long. I have exams and stuff and, you know. But I, you know, anyways, that would be a cool little extension if someone wanted to do that. And I'd be really interested to see what the animation actually looks like. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was very fun to make. I'm very excited for this new 3D software that I found. It's like I'm lots of really interesting plans for future videos in this channel. Remember to join the Discord server as well if you haven't already. We've got more than a thousand people now. We hit a thousand people, which is fantastic. What I really like is people are sharing projects and ideas, helping each other code. It's a really comfortable community for that sort of thing. So be sure to join. Let me know what you want to see next. I'm always looking for ideas of stuff to do on this channel. I'm not a genius. You know, I'm not going to solve the standard model on this channel. It's not sort of what I'm planning to do. But if you give me problems that are at my level, I will absolutely take a look and put them on my agenda. Anyways, I'll see you next time.